Good evening, everyone. My name is Joseph Papa, and I serve as a board member for the Library of Virginia Foundation and co-chair of the annual Literary Awards celebration. I'm delighted to welcome you to our nonfiction finalist panel conversation this evening and introduce Tracy Thomas, my good friend and host of the podcast, The Stacks. She'll be moderating an excellent conversation between these remarkable nonfiction finalists, Tracy McMillan Cotton, Andrea Dennis, Mary Lane, and Eric Nielsen. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the generosity of donors who, make, who have made this, the library's work possible, most notably this evening's sponsor, Dominion Energy. The, the Library of Virginia Foundation's work is vital, uh, it, uh, excuse me, the Library of Virginia Foundation's work is to find the vital resources that help the library collect, preserve, and share Virginia's stories. And we couldn't do it without you. Tonight, I ask you to consider joining me in supporting the library by contributing towards our $15,000 challenge match by calling 804-692-3599 or visiting the link on your screen in the comments. And on behalf of everyone at the Library of Virginia, I thank you in advance for your support. And now I'd like to welcome Tracy Thomas and our wonderful nonfiction finalist. Wonderful, Joseph, thank you so much. And thank you all for being here tonight. I am thrilled to moderate this panel of the nonfiction finalists. Um, we'll just start with introducing everyone. First up is um, Andrea L. Dennis. Andrea L. Dennis holds the John Bird Martin Chair of Law at the University of Georgia School of Law and was formerly an assistant federal public defender. She is a co-author of Rap on Trial, Race, Lyrics, and Guilt in America, and she lives in Athens, Georgia. Andrea's co-author is Eric Nielsen. Eric is an associate professor of, the, of liberal arts at the University of Richmond, where he teaches courses on African-American literature and hip hop culture. He is a co-author of Rap on Trial, and he currently, and he lives in Richmond, Virginia and Brooklyn, New York. Next up, we have Mary M. Lane. Mary is a nonfiction writer and journalist specializing in Western art, Western European history, and anti-Semitism. Lane received one of five Fulbright journalism scholarships at the age of 22. She gained international recognition as the chief European art reporter for the Wall Street Journal and published numerous exclusive page one articles on the art trove of Hildebrand Gerlitz. Since leaving the journal, Lane has been a European art contributor for the New York Times, and she splits her time between Berlin and Virginia. Mary's book is titled Hitler's Last Hostages, Looted Art and the Soul of the Third Reich. And finally, we have Tressie McMillan Cotton. Tressie McMillan Cotton is an associate professor of sociology at Virginia Commonwealth University and the author of Lower Ed and Sick, both from the New Press. Her work has been featured by The Daily Show, The New York Times, The Washington Post, PBS, NPR, Fresh Air, and The Atlantic, among others. She currently lives in Richmond, Virginia, and since I was sent these bios. She has had a very exciting um, honor. Just last week, it was announced that Tressie was one of the 2020 MacArthur Genius Fellows. So thank you all for being here so much. Um, that was all the really formal stuff. Now we're gonna have a good time, like a bunch of uh, book lovers. So we'll just start, um, we'll start with you, Andrea. Would you mind, and Eric, you can kind of tag team on this, telling us a little bit about your book, Wrap on Trial. So sure. So um, the book generally is an effort to expose a practice that's been going on in the criminal justice system for at least the last 15 or so years, which is the use of rap uh, lyrics. And now we see increasingly videos as evidence in criminal matters, whether that's to investigate, to charge, um, to surveil, to actually adjudicate cases or to impose uh, penalties. And so generally we're trying to expose this particular practice uh, and raise um, awareness about the practice and also um, provide information to a variety of audiences, whether practitioners uh, or lay people as to how they can um, uh, counteract this particular practice. And that's the lawyerly side. So Eric may want to weigh in on the, the other side, the hip hop side. Oh, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think I was ready for that. I, it, but it, but that's right. I mean, hip hop or rap music is really the only uh, musical genre, in fact, only fictional genre, um, to be targeted the way it is in the courts. And in addition to writing about it, um, in order to raise awareness, we wrote this book so that it could also be a tool um, for practitioners in particular, but others as well, uh, to end the practice. Uh, I, I testify in these cases uh, routinely. And it is absolutely heartbreaking to see 
um, young men in, sentenced to life in prison, uh, death, um, uh, are largely because they decided to pursue rap as an art form. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Mary and Lane. Mary, would you tell us a little bit about your book? Hi, sure. Um, so my book uh, it covers a wide scope from uh, the birth of Hitler all the way through to 2015. And even after its publication, it's now banned in Germany. So the saga continues. Um, yes, so uh, my book exposes, uh, it, it draws from a series of page one articles I wrote uh, when I was 25 and 26 as the chief European art reporter for the journal in Berlin. And it, it's about, um, there was a chilly night in February of 2012 and the German police uh, broke into the apartment of the son of one of Hitler's art dealers. And they did this because they were worried that he was committing tax evasion. And what they found in there was 1,300 works of art by all of the great European masters, Monet, Manet, Degas. They found a Matisse rolled up in a crate of tomatoes uh, that was worth millions of dollars. Uh, beautiful works for Rodin. And um, they confiscated them. And then in violation of international norms that they had signed in 1998, they kept the fine secret and evaluated the works not to see who the original owners were from whom Hitler stole them, but to make sure the girl that was paying his taxes. And um, I exposed all of this and I helped get two of the works back uh, to family members one of whom was a survivor of not only Auschwitz, but the 9-11 uh, Twin Tower attacks, um, who unfortunately recently died of COVID. Um, and I was just fascinated by how the German government just saw this as a tax matter and didn't see this as a, a matter of justice, especially when families were coming to them with proof that these works had been looted from, from Jewish German families. And so I decided to write a book and spent five years researching not just the art restitution side, but also how Hitler actually used culture and cultural appropriation and censorship to come to power. And he believed in, um, he believed that it was through culture and through controlling the culture that he could put forward this, this far right agenda that was in many ways driven um, by a lot of the parallels we see today, massive unemployment, the loss of a seemingly endless war, um, and often there were, you know, people, the people that, you know, helped him were doing this in many ways uh, to make Germany great again. So the book traces all of that all the way through to 2015. Amazing. Thank you. And then finally, Tressie, um, will you please tell us about your book, Fix? Certainly. Um, first, such a pleasure to be here in lovely company. Uh, I've read all of the books, uh, and so I'm a fan of my co-finalist here. Um, Thick uh, is part of my overarching intellectual project, which is the exploration and uh, uh, revision of the metaphors of mobility that animate uh, how modern Western society operates. So at the heart of what Dick is, is a collection of essays, and each essay tries to rewrite what mobility looks like in practice by unpacking the ideas that animate uh, the injustices of the way that social mobility uh, works, particularly in the US context. I do that a couple of ways. First, by starting with the really radical notion that black women's intellectual production is worthwhile. Uh, and so I say that I center black women's intellectual lives, both as craft and as process uh, throughout uh, the book. And that is one of the things that sort of holds those essays together. Um, and the other is my starting point for choosing to write uh, the book or to put these works together. I was initially drawing from years of public writing uh, when we decided to do this book. Uh, but when it came time to actually put the book together, uh, I decided to start from scratch. <laughs> uh, and I decided to do that because at the time that I started writing this book, I think in like 2016 or so, uh, there had not been a single black woman, full-time opinion editorial writer on staff with a major uh, US newspaper ever. 
hadn't been one at the New York Times, wasn't one at the LA Times, wasn't one at the Tribune. Uh, so if you were dropped down by some alien species into the United States and you said, take me to your leaders, you would be, uh, you'd be walked into a room where no one like me existed, except as an idea for control uh, and for extraction. So one of the things I wanted to show is by taking these sort of what I call the mundane everyday politics of life, what we choose to read, the popular culture we consume, uh, the things we choose to purchase, uh, where we go to the doctor, where we choose to live, how we go to school, that those everyday politics of how we live life uh, is rife with a, a richer understanding of social mobility uh, and inequality if we center Black women's intellectual lives as both rational uh, and critically humane to the greater project of, uh, of Western society. And so I do that, hopefully essay by essay, by showing how much richer our public life and political discourse would be if we uh, did that routinely. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for giving us a little background on your books. I did forget one piece of housekeeping, of course, because, you know, surprise. Um, for those of you watching at home, you can ask questions um, for us and we will get to questions at the end. So if there are things that come up that you're curious about, please drop the questions wherever you're watching, either on Facebook or YouTube. But for now, I get to ask the questions, which is always thrilling to me. Um, so as I read all three of these books, I was really impressed um, by how unique and different each book was in and of itself and also the conversation that was brought to the table for me as a reader. I read each one back to back. Um, which was a really exciting experience because the books are so wildly different on, on face value. And then when you start to read them, there's actually a lot of parallels in the conversations of race, um, value, art, systemic oppression, uh, government control. All of these themes really come together in these three different seemingly very different, but actually much more similar work. So one of the things I want to start with is um, and I, I'll start with you, Mary. You wrote a book about, about Hitler and about art. And I think many of us have read about Hitler and maybe some of us have read about art. And I'm curious how you approached your book to keep these ideas fresh and this story fresh and unique for your readers. Well, throughout history, I mean, that is a very good question. I think um, there are over a thousand biographies in English alone about Hitler. And uh, what I was struck with in, in reading and working is that uh, historically throughout history, most art and uh, culture professors have been homosexuals, gays, or they've been women. And so often their research wasn't taken as seriously. And so, um, I mean, I saw this myself when people would say, oh, you work for the journal. And when I was on the markets team, everyone was very impressed. And when I wasn't, there were certain macho type of guys that were just like, oh, it's art, it's culture. Um, and um, Hitler, uh, really, people think of him, you know, because of, you know, when they think of Hitler, they think of the concentration camps, of course, genocide, war with Russia, taking over Europe. And those are all vital and important parts of research. But how Hitler came to power to begin with was by realizing that he needed to control the culture. And so my book really focuses on how starting as a young boy wanting to be an artist um, all the way through uh, when he was a dictator, he said he was an artist first and, um, you know, a, di a dictator second, one could say. And so he he started out by waging a war on the press, by waging a war on art, by waging a war on a lot of activists who were creating art. Uh, he even had several of them on trial, um, much similar to the your, um, this sort of rap situation we're talking about now. And so uh, a lot of my book just focuses on, on that cultural censorship, but then also on the artists that put their lives on the line to fight back. Um, so one of them was named George Groth, and he was not Jewish, but he saw what was going on with the war on women, minorities, Jews in Germany, and made all of his art about that to the point where it, he was quite famous in America. And he had to flee Germany with his family because he was getting death threats from the Nazis. So um, it's a lot, um, that's how I approached it to keep it fresh. Wonderful. I'm gonna ask the same question, um, Andrea, of you, especially because in the book, 
Um, you focus, I, I, from my understanding of how this book was written, which we'll get to, you're more the, the law voice and, and Eric is more the culture voice. So I'm curious as someone who I'm sure is deeply versed in the ways that racism and, and this criminal justice system are deeply intertwined. How did you approach talking about the incarceration of young black men and Latinx men and to keep it fresh, to keep it feeling new and different? So, yeah, thank you. I think that's a great question. And I actually think um, the answer is, is rap and hip hop, right? So I think, right, one of the larger themes of the book, right, is about mass incarceration. And lots of people have written brilliantly about mass incarceration. And, um, you know, I teach those works uh, in my, um, my classes in law school. And so trying to think of a way to speak to, uh, uh, in some respects, a younger generation, but also an older generation. Right. So I'm of the era that grew up with hip hop. Right. So, you know, I I was around and I remember, you know, when um, uh, it all sort of broke, uh, broke loose uh, in, in New York. And so um, when I talk to many of my students, right, they're familiar with mass incarceration and maybe the sort of conversation gets a little bit stale for them because they're they're sort of they're on board. They understand what's going on. I talk it with them about it. And so trying to bring a new spin to the issue. Um, and then when I saw this was happening, I, I was taken aback as, again, someone who grew up with hip hop and loves hip hop and, and thinking, well, this is certainly a new perspective, a new twist on a very old, longstanding practice of um, uh, criminalizing and caging black men, black bodies. And um, uh, so I wanted to sort of use that as the the, the way to have a newer conversation about what was going on in and of itself, though, I think the phenomenon or the practice, the tactic is is problematic. And so it was both a way to introduce a new um, generation to the issue, um, but also talk to a little bit of those old heads, right? Um, uh, and um, explain the intersection between hip hop um, culture and community and the criminal justice system in a way that maybe the music heads weren't necessarily thinking about. Um, and so um, that was the way to, to keep it fresh and new, um, particularly for those who are already in the trenches and sort of have some sense of what's what's going on. Right. Um, Tressie, I, the question for you is sort of inverted, I guess, because I think that you're talking about things um, that people talk about so much for all other groups, which you mentioned, for all other sort of identities, um, but Black women are so often ignored in these spaces. So I'm curious what approach you used to bring Black women and their experiences to the front and center in a way that did not feel othering or or um, tokenizing, if you will. Yeah. So, you know, I bring the same sort of lens to this that I do to my academic work. I'm a sociologist by training and ethnographer primarily. And, you know, one of the first rules of ethnography is your subject never lies. By which we just mean respect the subject's subjectivity and their point of view. Now, do people lie? Absolutely. But your subject never lies. And if you believe they lie, you're doing the wrong job and you should leave them alone. It's just a fundamental respect for the humanity of the person that you're dealing with, whether that is that actual person sitting you know, across from you in an interview, or a disembodied person coming at you from the text. Um, if you don't just have sort of like a fundamental belief in the humanity of the person you're dealing with, you really cannot do that work well. Um, so in some ways I cheat, right? I, I just think black women are human. So that was actually probably the easiest part of my work. I don't really have to think about that. I think that we're rational and I think that we have economic lives. I think we have intimate lives. I think we do intellectual production. I think we're fallible, right? I think all of those things. So I, you know, that part for me was the easiest part. Um, you know, the, the crafting part was about finding in each essay and most things that I write, uh, especially when I'm writing for the public, I try to find the most grounded thing uh, to start with. Um, I can't assume that my reader thinks that black women are human mm. or are fully human, right? I know that I do. I know that the people I'm talking to do. I can't always assume that my reader will. Um, and so one of the things that I try to do is find a, a, like a really grounded material um, experience to ground every essay. Um, 
And I know it works when a reader comes to me and they think that the essay is about the material object, right? Um, so like I'll write this entire piece, for example, that's really about neoliberalism and they'll go, oh my God, the one about your mother's boots. And I'll go, yeah. I got you, right? Uh, how do you ground uh, this really complex conversation? Where can I find the smallest unit of shared humanity? It's a pair of boots. It's an experience in the doctor's office. Um, uh, it's driving a car a certain way, right? Like there are these really grounded experiences. Uh, and I usually try to, if not start with those in each essay, to certainly find it in each essay and in each argument um, as a way to get a reader to share my belief that Black women are trustworthy uh, subjects of their own experience. Um, and so I try to find the smallest, smallest unit of shared humanity uh, in every story. Um, and that's why focusing on sort of the everyday and the mundane is really important. Um, in a society that is as marked as ours is by extreme income and wealth inequality um, and racial discrimination and racism and sexism, there's not a lot we have in common anymore. Mm. We don't live in the same neighborhoods. We're not taking public transportation together. Uh, we aren't all going to the same restaurants. We're not watching the same news channels anymore. We're not watching yeah. you know, mass television anymore. We're all in our own Netflix streams. We don't have a lot that hangs us together. Uh, so I have to usually find a very small grain of, of an object for us to build some shared humanity together within the essay. Uh, and that's, I think, the power of like the everyday, the focus on the everyday. Yeah, that sort of leads me perfectly into my next question, which is for you, Eric. How do you approach talking about um, rap, music, and hip hop culture, which is for a lot of people not part of their everyday life, not part of their mundane life, not something that they're conversant in. How do you approach talking about this subculture in a way that is gonna be understandable and appreciable for, for your audience or your readers? Yeah, that's the challenge um, is, I mean, I will say that a lot of people do listen to it and are conversant. I mean, it is the most listened to genre in the country, but, but you're not wrong. I mean, especially when you start talking about potential jurors, um, so that's kind of how I think about it. I think about what I say to a jury uh, in order to get the, the jurors to understand just the basic conventions of the genre. I don't assume, it, it, it's kind of um, what Tressie was saying. It's trying to find something that you can connect with people on when otherwise you probably would not be able to. And so it is maybe finding analogs, you know, you wouldn't do this if Johnny Cash said, I shot a man in Reno. Um, and all of a sudden people can start to identify. And so I think the key for me, and I think one of the underlying assumptions uh, behind this misuse of rap lyrics as evidence is that um, the young men, and it's almost exclusively young men, black and Hispanic, um, are not capable of producing sophisticated art. And so it's much easier to just assume that they're rapping about something that they did, which by the way, happens to map perfectly to all kinds of stereotypes that we have about the inherent criminality uh, of young black men in particular. And, and, and so it really is to first explain what all of us or, or many of the artistic antecedents were. I mean, hip hop is, is unique, um, but at the same time, it's building on centuries of artistic evolution. So it's showing that uh, on the one hand, and then also explaining the roots of hip hop and they, that they're not about, it, it, many people I think have the misconception that hip hop is about promoting or perpetuating violence because they focus on the narratives in these, story, in these songs. Mm. But the truth is, is that hip hop was actually developed at least in the minds of many of its early pioneers um, as, as an antidote uh, to violence that was consuming the South Bronx and New York and eventually, you know, uh, all, hip hop spread everywhere. And so it really is just talking to them, understanding and, and appreciating that they don't know much about it, not talking down, but really kind of talking the, the art form up. Um, and, you know, my training is in literature. I'm an English PhD. Um, and so it, I, I think, I, I, I hope, I bring a little bit of credibility to it, um, but I, I, I do my best first and foremost to, and to go back to, again, Tressie's comment about humanity, to remind these jurors that not only are these young men um, 
humans, <laughs> which, which is easy to forget in a criminal justice context, um, but they're some of the brightest ones. Uh, these are kids that have minds that work so fast and to throw them away is, is, is especially tragic. And so I try to get all of that across in a relatively short period of time. Our book is relatively short, you know, but we're trying to be impactful uh, at the same time. And that's been the approach that, that I've used. I, I want to follow up just, I'm curious, you mentioned that um, hip hop music is one of the most listened to. And I'm curious why you might think, or why you could think that it's also presented as a subculture so much in, in American culture. Why, why we're taught that hip hop is something other than mainstream, which it is, if everyone's listening to it. Well, it's, it's mainstream. I mean, it's, it's arguably, I mean, I don't know how you really do these studies, but it's arguably the most influential musical genre of the last 60 yeah. years. Um, and so no doubt. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not, I think I think it's really a difference between hip hop's past and its present. Um, hip hop definitely was a a subculture, and it did uh, exist outside the mainstream. Um, I, I'm not sure who is still referring to it as subcultural. Um, I mean, yeah, sure, and, and some of it is, but no, it's become so mainstream. But that's part of our argument: is that it's become so mainstream that it actually. Uh, provides economic, in addition to artistic and all sorts of other um, uh, benefits, but economic mobility to young men who perceive very few options and frankly have very few options. Uh, you know, if you're not big enough to play football or basketball, you know, athletics or you play or, or rap. And so it's the mainstream quality that makes this whole thing so surprising to, to me, I think, is that as it's gotten more mainstream, you would think that people's understanding of hip hop would mean it's persecuted and prosecuted less and the opposite has happened. And I think it's in large part because certain segments of our population feel surrounded by it. I think it's actually more threatening because it's been so popular. And, and, and so that's, that's, that's what I've been trying to sort of uh, explain, but also navigate myself as I try to figure out why we're still in this position and it's only going to probably get worse before it gets better. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, kind of in the same line, I mean, one of the things that I was very surprised reading these works was, as I mentioned at the beginning, how similar, especially when it comes to the conversation of art and um, persecution and prosecution between Hitler's last hostages and rap on trial. I think when I when Joseph approached me to moderate this panel and he told me the three books, I sort of thought to myself, this is such a weird you know, combination of books. Like, how am I gonna do this? What's this gonna be? And I started with Hitler's last hostages. Um, and by the time I got through, I don't know, maybe the first two chapters of rap on trial, I was like, oh my gosh, these books are almost the same minus the heist element, but this idea of who decides what art is valuable and, and how that value is in connection with um, the power structure. Um, and Tressy, I think your book also is in conversation with that, but in a sort of different different way, but, but Rap on Trial and Hitler's Last Hostages were weirdly similar. Um, and so with that being said, I, I want to kind of bring it around to Virginia. This is a long way to get here, but I am very curious about, since this is the Library of Virginia, I'm trying to do a Virginia thing. We'll see how it goes. But this year, um, in the wake of the, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, among others, we saw in Virginia the Confederate monuments come down. And I'm curious, as people who are all involved um, in art, and the relationship of art to the public sector and the public sphere, what you all think that that maybe means or what that shows us and, and what connections you see between that and the work that you all have done and the research that you've all done. Um, and any one of you can start. I know that's very open. I, well, I think I, I actually was thinking about that in writing the book. I mean, I started writing it in the Obama era and then I was in Germany and predicted that Trump would get elected um, based on just a lot of my research. So um, I think that one thing that uh, Rap on Trial has in common with my book when I was reading it um, is this link to the judicial system. You know, Hitler, what's still going on in Germany today is that the statute of limitations for returning uh, Nazi looted art to Jewish 
uh, Holocaust survivors has expired in the 1970s. So the German government kept pointing out to me that his having this looted art that his dad ripped off the walls of Jewish victims was perfectly legal. And so what we see in, in the justice system in America and in Germany right now is that there are a lot of unjust things going on that are legal. Technically, everything Hitler did, with the exception, well, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, people were writing in the next day to ask whether it was legal what they had done to these Jewish shops, not to complain that it was immoral. And so Hitler just fixed the law and said you can loot Jewish shops. And so the justification in Germany at the time, and still a lot nowadays, for these injustices that have gone on and continue to go on that are racially motivated is that it was legal. And so I think, you know, you see that with the Confederate statues. I mean, what, one of the people who got back a painting is, is based here in Virginia that I worked with. But I think with the Confederate statues, you, that is also a debate of, you know, these people put them up and it was perfectly legal to do that. It's perfectly legal to have a Confederate flag in your, you know, on your lawn, but is that moral? Is that just? Is that racially fair? So that's that's something that I I was surprised in writing my book that I would need to emphasize as much as I did. So, and I think I think that the only way that we can truly understand racial injustices that are going on now is to understand the past. And I think that the Nazis are a perfect microcosm for the kind of racism that can erupt when people feel very insecure about their own identities or their national pride. I'll, say, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. I'm just a handful of blocks from those monuments right now. And, and Tressie, by the way, I didn't know you were still in Richmond. Uh, if you, I'm if you, not. I'm in Chapel Hill now. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, I, I, I actually, well, obviously it's, it, this is a good, <laughs> this is a positive development. I think what's more, what I'm more focused on is af what comes next is because that's great. It's symbolic. It's great. And, and especially if you're, if you're black driving down that road every day, seeing those monuments that by the way, are not that old, right? They were erected uh, to, to remind black people in the city uh, of what their place was supposed to be. And so I absolutely believe that their coming down uh, was the right thing. I also like how they came down. Um, I like that it wasn't uh, this tedious commission that's going on and on. The government now has to weigh all these interests in speech. The protesters, and it was so funny, the day before, I took pictures of the, of the monuments and put it up on Twitter and I said, nobody should fear these protesters except for these guys. And within a day, they were so defaced and they had to come down at that point. And I thought that was actually a wonderful thing because it was people exercising their rights to assembly, to speech. Um, it was peaceful. Yes, spraying things is still peaceful. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that the city of Richmond, but cities across the country are going to use this as this will help, this will be a catalyst for meaningful change because the monuments aren't really changing the fact that Richmond is, you know, a leader in nas nationally in evictions. It's not going to change the fact that we have uh, we have problems with our police department, just as other cities. So it, it, it's a good step. I just want to see more co come out of it. That wasn't that brief. Sorry. So I do have a brief thought. My my thought, um, I grew up in the in the D.C. metro area and so um, spent a little bit time visiting in Richmond, not a lot. Um, have visited Eric in, in Richmond. And so one of the things um, I, I continue to think about um, after the monuments came down is Arthur Ashe, right? That um, his statue may still stand. Oh, uh, if they didn't touch it. No one right. touched it. <laughs> right. And so that um, after all of this, after all of the bureaucracy and the legal questions and so on and so forth and um, grassroots activism, Right, that that Arthur Ashe is still standing there, and so I think of him as you know, um, right, and, and not just a tennis player, right, um, and certainly he's a Richmond Richmond native son, but um, uh, you you know, an international humanitarian, right? Um, he appreciated art, right? Uh, he was an intellectual and a pioneer and a leader, um, and so I, to your question, I think very directly, I just think about um, as a cultural. Um, figure 
that he still stands. And I think of sort of rap music in the same way. People thought it was just gonna go away. It was gonna be a blip on the radar. It wasn't really good culture, but yet, you know, decades later it is still here and more powerful and more potent than ever. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, I, I was in the middle of uh, moving a few weeks after uh, the protest started and, you know, the people took over uh, parts of uh, Monument Ave and turned it into Marcus Davis, P David Peters uh, Square. And um, so many of the groups that I worked with there uh, for quite a long time, the Richmond Bell Fund, uh, uh, the local student uh, democratic socialist groups, uh, just a lot of organizers who sort of made that space possible. And maybe about two weeks after the park had been sort of like reclaimed by the people, um, uh, there were a couple of anonymous um, complaints filed by homeowners on Monument Avenue about what this would do to their property values, that the statues were part and parcel of what made their neighborhood <laughs> historically distinct in a historic district, and that that was the covenant with which they had entered into uh, when they purchased their home on that block. And I and it brought to mind what I think is sort of like the fundamental nature of like racism and capitalism and how deeply intertwined and implicated they are in each other. Uh, that the that the symbols are important. They are certainly important when they are emblems of, you know, white racial violence, which the most of these monuments were. They were put up as sort of like public violence uh, to be part and parcel of the private violence that was enacted among African, uh, enacted upon African Americans in the area. But the, the, the foundation of it is that racism is quite profitable, isn't it? That, that racism becomes imbued in property values and well manicured lawns and school districts and the uh, wealth and racial profile of your neighbors. Um, and I read the, because um, I'm not sure they became, I think they were written as. Uh, uh, they were going to they were going to sue, but I'm not sure they were ever filed. But I might be wrong on that. But I read the petition by the home, the anonymous homeowners, um, and the language was fascinating. You know, we have no problem with Black Lives Mattering, and in fact, we love Black people, and we absolutely think Black Lives Matter. Um, but so does my uh, home's value, right? Uh, and how easily, uh, you know, they were able to equate Black Lives Matter to property and how antiquated those ideas. I mean, really, the, the, the pleadings would not have been, would not be out of place among bills of sale during the antebellum South, you know, just the language of them, human, human beings, property, what, you know, the value of my home, the people who work here, that kind of language. Um, and it just brought to mind to me how much we um, invest in the maintenance of the symbols, um, to distract from the ongoing maintenance of what undergirds those symbols, which is that Monument Avenue is one of the wealthiest districts in Richmond. Uh, and, 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 that, and that that matters as much as the statues do. And we're not convening anything for that. There, 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 there is, to my knowledge, there, there's, no, there's no commission on why Monument Avenue is worth so much money. <laughs> no commission about what it would look like for that to be different. Um, and I think of that as synodote for like this larger issue of what undergirds racism um, and, and how brutal the culture wars get. Um, and that when we try to make the conversation about sort of those very material uh, inequalities, how much more brutal the conversations become. Because I think fundamentally uh, the police, the violent police response to the very peaceful Richmond protesters became violent, particularly because they were marching on Monument Ave. Mm. Uh, oh, <laughs> and, so, um, and so that to me is like the, to me, the, kind of the heart of what Richmond has to decide about what it's going to be. Uh, the New South, the, the New South mantra has been, we have to be too busy to hate to borrow from the Atlanta mantra. Um, and I think Richmond is so steeped in being a historical city, it can't decide if it's gonna be too busy to hate and move into the New South uh, of tomorrow. And this is a moment where, the, where we're gonna have to decide. And that there are a lot of people, you know, people, whether they agree with them or not, they're gonna owe those young people a lot. 
they owe them a lot for forcing that conversation and putting a really meaningful set of terms on the table for the public. Well, I think yes. it's good that America's having this conversation. Um, as I mentioned briefly before, Germany banned my book um, and because the one of the lawyers representing uh, and helping the Nazi art dealer's son uh, complained about it. And Germany took his side. And there are a lot of statues in Germany of prominent Nazis and by prominent Nazis that are still up. And they're just not having a dialogue about it. I mean, the very, um, the very square that they raided this apartment on is named after a prominent Nazi playwright. I found that a bit, a bit ironic. So I think, um, yeah, I think that these dialogues can be contentious, but the important thing is to have them. And that's something that my, I think my book shows Germany is, is doing. So. Okay, if I could just add one last thing, it's that a block or two from these monuments that have been, you know, taken down, most of them, not Arthur Ashe, which has been, by the way, uh, the, the main boulevard that, you know, lots of businesses, the VMFA are, is on, has been renamed Arthur Ashe for those of you who aren't Richmonders. So it, he, he, he still is, but what I think is uh, equally inspiring, still symbolic, but inspiring is that as those came down, I think those came down, Shortly after a Kahinda Wiley, um, you know, went up at the VMFA, and it was that is I'm hoping to answer to or at least respond to what Tressie was talking about about what direction Richmond's going to go. I hope that's the direction that it goes. Is that it's not just about undoing certain things; it's about asserting what the future needs to look like. And that again is just a symbol. But you're about to see a great exhibit at the VMFA called the Dirty South that is going to continue this uh, be, uh, because of some really smart people who are coming in and hopefully moving us in the right direction, not the wrong one. Um, I, I would like to have this conversation for hours and hours. If it were up to me and I was just sitting with all of you chatting, this is all I would want to talk about. Obviously, um, I'm not in charge. I'm not even in Richmond. Um, <laughs> I've been there twice, full disclosure. But um, I, I think we should transition back more squarely to your books. Though, again, if you've ever listened to my podcast, The Stacks, all I want to do is have these conversations that are slightly tangential to the work itself. Um, Tressie was a guest on the show, and I do want to transition slightly to something we talked about because I found it to be fascinating and I still think about it, um, which is research and the ways that you all uh, engage with the research that you've done for your books. Um, again, Mary's book and, and Andrea and Eric's book, it, you can tell that it's heavily researched and that you brought, all took a lot of the data points and the, and the things that you discovered and you turned it kind of into narrative. Um, and in Tressie's case, it almost is the opposite. It feels like you started with, you know, or, or and I've heard you say this before, I think on the podcast, you mentioned how you took the data and you reanimated it into a personal as opposed to distilling down the data into, um, gosh, I don't, I, I'm like not even smart enough to, to even repeat back what you said, but it was really good. Oh. You, also to <laughs> <laughs> you had some great things to say about reanimating data. But <laughs> my question sort of is, how do you, each of you, approach research and how do you turn your research into narrative or or written word how do you distill it down how do you engage with it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah on a nonfiction panel i think that's just the thing it's the thing i'm certainly like most personally interested in these days um i had a challenge for myself in writing um thick which was uh you know how can i make just to the extent that you believe in objectivity, let me just put that part on the table. But how can I take objective uh, fact and make them beautiful? Even if the data themselves are telling this really horrible story, but to, to make it beautiful, because I do believe that powerful stories and open up a certain type of political imagination mm -hmm. in the, in public life. And so I wanted it to be powerful. Like I'm not, you know, I'll be, you know, let me just put it on the table. I wanted it to be pretty and I wanted it to be powerful and I wanted it to be beautiful. Um, and I wanted somebody to put it down at the end of it and think uh, that they had had uh, 
an enjoyable experience, even if the way that they were changed after it, they didn't enjoy. Because that's the thing. Sociology is really, quite honestly, the study of like some of the most horrible parts of human society and functioning. Um, and so if I just did my straightforward job, I would never write anything beautiful. My job, I document things like, oh, going to college won't make your life better because student debt has perverted the American dream. <laughs> like that's my job, that's my day job, right? I'm never gonna get the chance to write something beautiful. So what creative nonfiction allows me to do um, is to still engage all of that, that data, um, to engage like the statistical reality. Um, but to wrestle with making them a powerful narrative and story. Um, I mean, in the process of that, it's, uh, you know, differs a little from argument to argument. It usually depends on how well I know the data coming in, whether I'm starting with a question or I'm starting with a conclusion. Like I know that, you know, I know the story backwards and forwards of how education mobility works in this country, right? So I was starting with the conclusion. So then I back my way out. But sometimes I go in with a question and I don't yet know the answer. Um, and so I start with a, with a, you know, a search mission. Um, and my essay is actually a really constructed um, very systematically, collecting the data, analyzing it. Um, I'm a little old school. I do still use paper. I like I love a timeline so I can see the relationship between these big movements, right? When people move around, when money moves around, I'm always tracking the money. When money moves around, what happens, you know? Um, but once I've got it, then it's just sitting down and going, I can't massage the data. I can only massage the craft and the language and the stories that I tell. Mm. How do I find the representative stories in this piece um, and try to make that as artful as I possibly can? And that's just the challenge I think every writer has when they sit down, which is about craft, picking a voice, picking the details that matter, um, uh, stringing them together in, a, um, in an efficient way. That, that's the, the creative part. And it's made harder when you're writing a book with another person, because when you're trying to figure out voice and things like that. And so it's it's funny. Um, you mentioned, Tracy, that, uh, you know, obviously, Andrea is our legal expert. And I don't know that this book could be done without her. Um, but it's funny. What we did was we did try to make sure to even out voice. So I actually wrote a lot of the legal stuff. Um, because I, lawyers tend to write, they go into lawyer mode and it starts to feel like you're reading some brief. Now she was the, she had to sign off on every sentence to, to make sure that I was being accurate. Uh, but it was, it was a, a situation like that where we wanted to sort of re make it as accessible as possible, even when we were talking about really kind of abstract, uh, law. And so finding a voice there was very difficult. And it was also difficult because we felt as if we were trying to speak to so many different um, uh, readers uh, and we wanted to achieve so many different things among them. Uh, that was our, that was a very big challenge, bringing it, bringing it all together. I don't know if it, we did it perfectly, but we, that it, it was a very hard book to write, even though it's relatively brief. It was, it, it beat us up. It did. I think for me, um, coming into this from being a journalist and a journalist that has a disdain for journalists that input their opinion into stories, uh, it was hard for me to have to do that and add my my opinions and analysis. But I, you know, I got there. But my book, it had such a long. It's narrative nonfiction, so it essentially reads like a novel, but it's all true. So if I'm giving you the weather or that Joseph Goebbels' hair was moving in the wind, like I have put in that. Um, it was in many ways easier to do the older research because I feel that the German government didn't think I was digging around in the present day. Um, they, I did research in German and English and some French since German's my third language um, after Chinese. And um, it was um, harder to do the research nowadays in many ways. So the German equivalent of the Library of Congress had me sitting at a computer looking at a computer screen of a scan of a scan of a document I should have just made to a person. Um, and you can't copy it and you can't print it out. And half the time they're purposely made grainy so you don't know what you're looking at. Um, so that was, 
that was really frustrating to do. But I, I was surprised with the narrative nonfiction of how um, how much and how I got really invested in the characters. Um, so there was the artist that I was talking about earlier, George Gross, who risked his life um, to fight the Nazis. He came back to Germany after the war and he um, ended up drinking so much he fell down the stairs and broke his neck. And even when I was writing that, um, I was, you know, like crying and like, I have to drink wine to get through this. I felt so attached to him personally that, um, that I felt like I was killing him somehow. But I guess the most surprising thing for me was I got very emotional writing about the Goebbels children being killed by the propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, his wife murdered all of their children. And I was just so surprised at how emotional I found it. I think because the, these were such young kids that they had, I mean, you're talking about five-year-olds. They had no idea what their parents were doing. And you just sort of see how easily they were indoctrinated into thinking that their uncle Adolf was like the greatest person in the world and that it was okay to kill Jews because they're not really humans. Um, and I guess that was the most surprising part about my research is how I kind of got attached to characters. So I would say for me, um, it's it's been an interesting journey. So I'm relatively new to trying to write in this sort of creative nonfiction or narrative nonfiction um, uh, style or format. So trial lawyers, um, which I was a trial lawyer for a number of years, right? We're all about narrative. We are all about creating a story, right? Um, that explains for me on my side, right? My client's um, innocence or why the government hasn't proven its case, why my client should not be found guilty. So um, in that professional role, right? Narrative was extremely important. You're always trying to present a narrative that is gonna resonate with your reader or your juror, right? You're trying to flip the narrative that's being offered by the government. Um, legal academia, though, right, uh, with the exception of some types of legal scholars, right, generally eschews narrative, right? Um, and so I've been in that vein for so long, right, um, trying to, to figure out how to step out of that and go back to more storytelling was was a challenge. Now, it helps if you get, you know, your co-author to be an English professor, right? Um, and if you have a great editor for, you know, a book editor who's reminding you, you know, you look, you need to, to, to shift here. Right, um, and so that was an interesting challenge um, uh, to for me to take all of the data and the information and the cases and um, as, right. I do a lot of very unhappy, distressing, depressing work, right? But to figure out how to present it in a way that the reader is not just going to want to put it down immediately because they're so depressed and never pick it back up. Um, was um, was a challenge, and like Eric said, I hope I hope we got there. Um, we heard some people say, you know, we couldn't put it down. Others say I put it down, but we picked it back up. So it was an interesting process, and one that I hope to to um, to engage with more. We have the same editor, do we not? Oh, Zakia. Is it Zakia? Okay, no, sister editors at the same press. Okay, because I know we're we're on the same press, and I said, and your process, the um. The, the prodding of staying in the story, like keeping your voice. There's a lot of that. So yeah. I'd also have to have a great editor with my <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. Um, so just for people at home, if you have questions, please leave them in the comments because we're about to get to the question section, but I'm not quite done being nosy. So um, one of my favorite questions to ask about on the podcast, which is just uh, something that I like to do because I think it humanizes authors uh, at least for me, I'm someone who is sort of idolizes authors. I think books are amazing. So the people who write them are my heroes personally. But one of the things I like to do is bring them down to my level. So I'm going to ask each of you, it's just really one word answer. What is the word that you can never spell correctly on the first try? Oh. <laughs> it's instant humanity right there. Everyone has one. Yeah. <laughs> sword. For me, it's sword. Like sword in the stone? Yeah, like the thing you fight with. Really? I should never do it. And it seems like a really easy word. I will say my editor says that I use the word quip too much in the book. Hmm. I wrote that I don't spell right. Yeah, but yeah, I would say sword. Interesting. Application. And I'm weirdly committed to using the daggone word. I think because I know I can't spell it. So like What's I use it all the time and <laughs> every single time. 
have to go look it up. Just for the record, it is not at all what it looks like. There's an extra S. It's one of those English words that's just screwing with us. There are too many S's in it. <laughs> I mean, I, I get them all right. Um, <laughs> no, come on. No, 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 no. No, you know what it is? It's uh, uh, it, it's uh, it's harass or harassment. I always yeah. forget how many R's and R's, S's. Yeah. And I think it's one R and two S's. Uh, but I, I constantly, I'm right. I, I think I'm right, right? Uh, You're asking truly the worst person. I can spell zero words correctly on the first try. <laughs> well, I'm Googling it right now. Okay. Um, so I'm struggling. I'm really struggling. It's not because I think, uh, well, I actually do think I'm a pretty good speller, um, but I know there are lots of words I, I misspell or I can't say correctly. And, um, Nielsen. You know what? I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with one that I actually, I, I can probably spell it. I have a harder time saying it. Retributivist. Um, I know that word. <laughs> retributivist? Is this a legal one? It's a um, philosophy. Okay. Um, so the, so the, the, the common um, saying might be an eye for an eye. Um, retributivists believe that, right, you get what you deserve. Um, oh, okay. Gotcha. Retributivist, I think. Is that what we're saying? Retributivist or retributivism. Retributivism. Okay. Gotcha. All As opposed right. to utilitarian. Easy. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, and then this is my, I just love that question. This is my last, I guess, official question until we get to audience questions, but I think it's a nice way for me to at least wrap up with you since this is an event in honor um, of all of your work and the Library of Virginia. I'd love for each of you to tell just a quick story um, or whatever pops into your mind when I ask you to tell a story about your relationship to a library, any library. It can be the Library of Virginia, but it could be your childhood library. Just some, some quick little story or anecdote about your relationship to the library. So I'll start. I grew up in, um, at the time, Frederick County, Maryland, which was fairly rural at the time, you know, over 40 years ago. Um, and in the neighborhood I grew up in, we had um, the bookmobile come um, weekly. And um, so I would walk up the hill to the bookmobile whenever it came, right? And just enjoy being in the bookmobile and collecting all the books. And of course, you know, I developed a relationship with the, the librarian there and just taking all those, those books home. So that's my first real um, thought of a library. You know, I've obviously spent time since then in, in many other libraries, but that is sort of what really just brings it home for me. I just love the idea of a bookmobile, a small space, a little um, cove where you can pick out all the books you want and walk back down the hill with them. I'll say that mine was, uh, I had, I was at a crossroads. I was studying in London. I was studying uh, Shakespeare Ooh. and I'd always been a hip hop head. Um, but, you know, when I was coming through in the academy, you know, academia, I, I, there, you didn't have hip hop as a thing that you studied. There were a few people who were doing it, Trisha Rose, a couple other people, but nobody was doing it. Mm -hmm. And I was in the British library which is so much better than the Library of Congress because they actually have the books that they say they have and they can find them and give them to you. Um, is Jay, that, that's shade, Eric. I, well, I'm just saying, I went there went to the Library of Congress once and I asked for like seven or eight books and they got one. They couldn't find the others. Mm -hmm. Well, the British Library, I, when I was in England, I, I, I re... I rediscovered hip hop. I mean, I was still listening to it, but I had sort of been in other spaces. And I just remember being in the British Library, writing about Hamlet, listening to Outkast, and deciding, you know what? I don't think I can keep doing this as what I do for my career. And it took a long pause before I pivoted, uh, but it was the library setting for some reason. It's not even the library, it could have been anywhere. But that's where I sort of decided, no, I'm gonna take a different direction. Uh, I don't, I don't know if that's useful or not, but that's true. Um, let's see. Uh, I also have the growing up, going to the library stories. We are a family of readers and there, it was not uncommon for there to be three generations of Macmillan women in a library together. Um, so much of that shaped my life, uh, so much so that I now teach uh, in an information and library school. Um, but I, I think probably the one where I was like, you know, that first came to mind when you said it, my first week at Emory in graduate school, 
I remember going to the library. I had come from public institutions. I had never attended a uh, private university uh, and did not understand in just a very real sense how different that was. I walk into the library at Emory University uh, and there's a cafe, you know, in the middle of it and you can eat and drink while you read the books. Well, so that blew my mind. And I thought, so no matter how badly uh, graduate school went, I stayed because I could eat and drink in the library. I thought, I don't care what these people do to me. There's a library where I could eat a sandwich at three in the morning and, and the library, I'm sorry, the cafe's open all night and so is the library. The library's over 24 hours, so is the cafe. I lived in there. I would wake up at 2 a.m. and go to the library and stay to work till like 6, 7 a.m. It's my favorite place. And I thought, I don't care what these people do to me. I'm never leaving here. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, let's see. Well, my mother was a librarian uh, at WNL, Washington Lee. And um, so I grew wow. up really appreciating books. She would actually correct all the grammar in my children's books. Um, but I think I really started liking the library in middle school because I had no friends. And so I would go to the library and books were my friend. I was on a Stephen King tear uh, in middle school, I think, because I, I went to an evangelical Christian school that um, makes Jerry Falwell look liberal. And so they really disapproved of these Stephen King books. So that my, I guess my way of rebelling was reading books. Um, but I also, um, I share with you with the Emory University thing, I, I went to Middlebury and you can eat and drink in the library there. Oh, yeah. And it's, real, it's really nice to, you can't do it with the rare books, obviously, but um, it's just, it made it so much easier to have to like study, because I, I did dual degrees in German and Chinese. And so, there was a lot of work uh, there. And I just remember when we were all writing our honors theses, because mine was in German and my friends were too, and people were actually bringing in like little like grills and like slow cookers that they would like keep in their carols and like microwaves so that they can <laughs> meals. So I suppose that would be, that would be my, um, my favorite library memories. I love these food and library stories because I just feel like the library and the food are antithetical to me. I feel like that's one of the reasons I don't like to go to the library, I like to check books out so I can eat at home. But <laughs> um, So we're gonna go to the questions from um, the audience. And again, if you're watching now, please feel free to drop questions into the comments there and, and we will get to them. Um, well, we'll start with this question, which is, did the authors struggle with using first person versus third person in terms of their voice? Cressy, why don't you start? I see that big head nod. I mean, you know, I'm an academic, uh, so there is no first person. And uh, it is, it was absolutely a decision, like a decision. It was, you know, the LeBron James of decisions. Like, are you going to do first or <laughs> third words? Like, because it determined almost everything else. It, de it, it determined so much of like what were going to be style choices. It determined readership in a very real way. Um, uh, determined how the book would be positioned, you know, all the marketing and everything that goes around the book. Um, and frankly, it felt like your, or I felt like to speak to speaking of first or third voice. It <laughs> felt like a it felt like a monumentous decision about who I was going to be professionally. Mm -hmm. If you write this thing in first voice, then you're that person, right? Um, uh, so yes, there was a, absolutely a moment when I decided that's what I was going to do. Um, and strangely enough, the choice was informed by my my first book, which had been just sort of very classic sort of sociological um, analysis. Uh, and I'd studied like for-profit colleges. And, and based on that book, I'd done a lot of like testifying and Senate and um, that kind of thing, a lot of uh, policy adjacent work. And I was struck by how often I was asked to like come to Congress or something, not because of my data, but because of my stories. Mm -hmm. And that strangely enough gave me sort of like the gumption to choose to sort of double down on narrative and storytelling uh, in the next book. Because despite like all that empirical data, what was driving these really massive conversations were the stories. And I thought, well, why run from that? And it really was the, the most one of the most important decisions made in writing the book early on. Ours was just more. <laughs> there are two of us. And so if, if there is something where I, you know, for example, I testify in these cases, Andrea doesn't, she consults legally, 
But how do, at what point do we talk about just me versus her? It's just actually, how do you handle that writing? It was very awkward. <laughs> and and it, it, I don't feel like it was as important to the tone or the readership at Tressy as yours, because uh, that's a, just a fundamental decision you had to make. Ours was just how to pull it off. And so, and talking about ourselves in the third person, I find to be so awkward. I hate it. And we did do it. We did it. And, and, and I didn't like it, but I don't know what the better alternative was uh, when you have two voices. So, uh, but I, I can't stand writing about myself in the third person. It's just the worst. <laughs> okay. Mary, anything okay. to add? I, yeah, I, I echo what I echo what Eric said. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, the only time that I really use first person is in the prologue and the epilogue. Um, for me, it was just weird. First, as a journalist, and then writing the book, that it was kind of the first time in my career that I was part of the story, because a lot of what the German government was doing um, was in reaction to my writing and to my reports and to my stories. Um, and so that was, I, I'm very, like I said, I'm very uncomfortable with that style of journalism. I think it undermines the craft to be like, I'm the persecuted journalist, you know, um, cause this is the news. Um, but I think um, it, it was a weird situation being in that, um, but I kind of just kept it to the prologue and the epilogue. Um, and then, you know, I think for me, yeah, I would say that for me, it, it, the book was a mixture of my, you know, I don't really think that it's, it's opinionizing for me to say, you know, Hitler was bad, but, um, when it came to a lot of the art restitution, um, stuff and, and the push for Germany to take away the statute of limitations that they still have, um, that is where... I guess I tried to say it without inserting first person too much because I think the story is stronger when the journalist is not doing that. Yeah. So I'm being told that there are no more questions from the audience, which is fine. I'm going to, I'm going to ask one more question then because why not? I, I came prepared. I have so many more questions. Um, unfortunately, I feel like maybe I shouldn't ask all of them, but I think this is maybe a good place to end. One of the things that is unique about, the Library of Virginia Book Awards is that all of your books were written in 2019 and we're now coming to the end of 2020. Yeah. And so I'm curious um, as someone who, again, has talked to many authors and I know that many authors are passionate about the idea of um, revision. I'm curious what, if anything, you might change or or have done differently if your book was coming out. How could you? Could you stop? <laughs> well, that a good one? I feel like that was a hard one. <laughs> That's the word. No, it's actually too yeah. easy. Yeah. Not fair. Yes. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, this is. I mean, this is. This is the the seventh circle of hell for a writer, right? Life keeps happening while you're trying to finish something, and it is so annoying. Um, I mean, obviously, I think I would have. You know, there are certain substantive things like argument wise, like to I have a, a piece about how a Donald Trump could have followed a Barack Obama and how they actually, their candidacies emerge from the same impulse, which is America's uh, need to believe in itself as progressive as, the, as it governs as a conservative country. And so actually the same impulse produces both presidencies. I mean, and obviously we're just looking here at such a much longer tail of what that looks like and what that impulse is like. And it's just so clear that we're in the middle of sort of a white racial reclamation project. Um, and I would have probably uh, loved to have explored that more. Um, you know, I've got a whole list, seriously. I think it's, I think most writers do. The first time you read it when it comes off the press and I go through it, I mark every mistake. So if you'd like to see that, I have, a, I keep a running doc, Google document of everything. <laughs> I was like moved around and changed. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, life just keeps happening and our news cycle at this point for somebody who like responds and like the culture, it's just moving so fast that, yeah, there's so much more I would have done. I have two things I would have done. I would have liked to have done, or if I were revising, one would be 
to have more of the voices of the people who are actually incarcerated. Um, it's that it's surprisingly, if you're not, if you don't work in this environment, difficult to get to inmates, which is disturbing in its own. Um, but the fact that I, I really wanted to have more of those voices and stories, and it was going to take us way off our timeline, I mean, by a year at least. Mm -hmm. And so we sacrificed that. I also wish we could have done more with the data, but now I actually realize that that was not something that we were equipped to do. Neither of us is, you know, is a, we're not social scientists. We don't, we don't do a lot of data work. And that's going to come as a follow-up to this project, but that it probably wasn't going to be appropriate here. Um, th but those were my, th th that's what I would have liked to have been able to do more of. So I think I would have wanted to have um, more of a conversation about uh, this this phenomenon, this practice, and and youth. And by youth, I mean, um, you know, high schoolers. What's going on, in particular, uh, in high school um, with juveniles? Um, Look, you've got editors, you've got you've got limits, you've got external limits, and so some things end up on the cutting room floor. But I would have liked to have more of that conversation about what's going on in um, K through twelve or or eight through twelve. Um, mm -hmm. I think, and there are a lot of distressing stories. But part of also the problem about having that story and telling that story is because even more than um, trying to make contact with uh, inmates, and that's a, that's a significant problem and barrier. Um, to 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 talk to those who who are caged is trying to figure out what's happening in juvenile courts and with juveniles and for all sorts of reasons which I which I think about and research and teach um, but being able to tell their stories would have I think added another layer uh, to this that's important but again that's another one of those that trying to get those stories could have taken years. Mm. Um, a few things. I think I wish. I had had more time to put um, what happened to a lot of the Nazis that are in the book after the war, because um, particularly women tended to get away with murder, literally, um, in many cases, um, because it's sort of a weird form of sexism, like that women aren't capable of being murderers. Um, and I think I wish, to be honest, my my German is fluent, but my French is a bit shaky. Um, I've got a fellowship to to learn that and improve that. Um, it's going to happen next year. But uh, there's a great German saying by Ludwig Wittgenstein, which is uh, the borders of my language create the borders of my world. And so I think um, a lot of what happened with looted art and particularly with the Matisses that were in um, this girl at collection, including the one that was stuck in the crate of tomatoes, um, were uh, looted from France. Um, Hitler really had it out for France, so he did proportionally more looting there than in any other country. Mm -hmm. um, they also helped him um, because they have a huge anti-Semitic streak there, unfortunately. Um, and I didn't really put a ton of stuff about the French in there. Um, including Matisse's daughter, who was part of the resistance movement and was very badass, um, just because I couldn't read the French. So it's sort of a reminder that if you know you don't speak a language or you don't have the terminology to even talk about something in your own language, that um, that's going to be very limiting for you. Thank you all so much. This was really such a treat. Um, congratulations again to all of you for, for being finalists for this award and for your work. As I mentioned, I am a fangirl for authors. So thank you all for talking with me and letting me get to ask you nosy questions. Um, I think Joseph comes back and like tells us bye, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. I do. I, I... I come back and I tell you goodbye. Um, unfortunately, um, the word that I can't spell is necessary. Oh, me too. And uh, oh, that, is, that is exactly what this evening was. So thank you all oh. so much for, uh, for being here. And uh, I want to thank uh, everyone who joined us online. We had a uh, great, great crowd there. Uh, thank you, Tracy, and to this uh, incredible group of authors for sharing their insights. Um, and and talking about their books, um, I, I too was um, fan fangirling. Um, I hope that you'll all uh, join us uh, join the Library of Virginia's fifteen thousand dollar challenge match. You can call the number 
that is listed in the comments, 804-692-3599, or visit the link that is there on your screen. Uh, your support will be doubled tonight, and I hope that everyone will join us tomorrow evening for uh, the chance to hear Philip Deloria, the Art and Literature Mary Lynn Cox Award recipient, for his book, Becoming Mary Sully, Toward an American Indian Abstract. Uh, that event will be presented in partnership with the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, and of course, tune in on Saturday to find out who the winner of the literary awards are with our host, Adriana Trigiani, and our featured speaker, <clears throat> featured speaker David Brinkley. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, and have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>